Hello, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Thursday's Dyer Literary Series. I just unplugged everybody. So uh, tonight, my uh, guest is Katie uh, Moulton. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about her, if I can get up her bio. I did everything, but I did, I did everything. I had everything all prepared. And all right, so here we go. Um, this is a... Uh, there we go. Oh, Katie, my website. <laughs> Katie Malter is a writer, editor, and music critic. Her audio memoir, Dead Dad Club on Grief and Tom Petty, was released by Audible last June in 2022. Her essays, stories, and articles appear are forthcoming on Salon, The Believer, New England Review, Swansea Review. You can go to her website and read all of the wonderful credits. Um, and that's katiemalton.com. Um, she earned her MFA. Um, at Indiana University. She's the editor of the, where she was the editor of the Indiana Review. Um, she's been a culture journalist for Voice Media Group newspapers since 2009, was the music editor of Westward in Denver. She's worked as a DJ, a festival organizer, a venue manager, and literary editor. Born and raised in St. Louis, she now lives in Baltimore and teaches the writing seminars at Johns Hopkins University and the Newport MFA at South Virginia University. Her go-to karaoke jam, Black Pulsita by <laughs> Danger. So uh, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to you for a few minutes. Uh, you can read either from your book or anything that you would like, and uh, then we'll be back at you. Okay, uh, well, thank you. Hello, everyone who's here and on Facebook, potentially. Um, thanks for having me join this awesome community that you have going. Um, I'm going to read um, one section um, from my memoir, Dead Dad Club. And as you may have guessed from the subtitle, it's about grief and Tom Petty. Um, when I was growing up, when I was a small child, my dad worked as a record store manager. And that has informed a lot of the way that I grew up and came to see the world and later became a rock critic myself. And so um, my writing about my personal experience and love and grief um, is sort of inextricable from also writing about music. So I'm going to read a section that shows that. Um, this is called Here Comes My Girl. The mixed CDs, David, number one through four, were made quickly, compiled by an old friend of my dad's. We played them at the wake and funeral in the car on the way to the cemetery. Mama and I wandered through those days after his sudden death as the dazed hosts of a series of bewildering parties. I was 17 and she was wailing. It was helpful to have a ready-made soundtrack, one less logistic. These songs, she talks to angels by the Black Crows, Angie by the Rolling Stones, reflected my dad in some ways, the man his friend mourned, and the regret of aging rock and roll bands. But when I won't back down cycled through, I thought about a Tom Petty interview in the early 90s when he said, quote, actually, I think it's a good idea to back down sometimes. At the funeral, Mama and I took our places in the front row of chairs. The first strains of Dust in the Wind by Kansas drifted over the assembled. My mortification was instant and profound. I hunched over in my chair. My friends and I had just seen the comedy Old School at the movie theater. And in one scene at the burial of an elderly frat pledge who died in the midst of a KY jelly wrestling match, Will Ferrell sings Dust in the Wind a cappella. He warbles to the overblown finish, then chokes out, you're my boy, Blue, you're my boy. I couldn't help myself. I turned backwards in my chair and dissolved into laughter. A few rows back, one of my friends welling up mouthed for me to shush. I only laughed harder. I shook. Beside me, Mama shook too. She whimpered, crying out loud in the way of children and dogs. We were the only noise in that Indiana funeral parlor. She looked at me, her eyes all blue sky and flood. She gripped my shoulder and cried harder. I never said, Dad would know this is corny, that he would remember the original late 70s music video, the band's absurd ruffled shirts, the self-important strings, the Jesus froze, the yodel of nothing lasts forever but the earth and sky. 
that I had come home after seeing old school on a Friday night and told him he would love it, that he would laugh. I never told mama that I wasn't crying, but when we got home, I made David number five, my first mix. Baby Blue by Badfinger, Tangled Up in Blue by Bob Dylan, Good Riddance by Green Day, a band we loved since my dad brought home their breakout record and told me the neighbor and the neighborhood boys it was cool. I was eight and Dookie was my first album. The mix ended with Walls by Tom Petty, a lesser known single that dad always said reminded him of mama. You got a heart so big, Petty echoes, over a tilt-a-whirl organs and strings, it could crush this town. Over the years, I burned dozens of CDs for Mama, the titles carefully lettered around the hole at the center. 12 years later, Mama said yes to her boyfriend, Jim. He took her to a cannabis convention in Denver, and she took him to see Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers at Red Rocks, where he asked her to marry him. They set the date for early October. She texted me photos of off-white dresses, oohed and odd over the converted barn strung with white lights they booked for the ceremony. I borrowed a dress from my best friend's mom, burgundy wool that fit like a glove and time accordioned around me. Uh, in addition to the toast, she assigned me the job of wedding DJ. I loaded my iPod with hundreds of songs, the mama and Jim mix, not only for the ceremony and reception, but to play as a personal soundtrack for Mama throughout the day. The right songs could keep her calm, could cement a memory or bring back a better one. It was one less logistic. I carried around a soap dish lifted from the wedding hall to serve as a makeshift speaker. I vowed to anticipate the just right song to play in any given situation. That meant no dust in the wind, no songs at all from the David mixes. The afternoon of Mama's wedding, her best friend Barb directs us as we, stick, as we stick final flowers in the centerpieces, white and green, artfully disarranged around the airy barn. A photo of Mama and Jim all dressed up for their junior prom is blown up and framed, propped near the door. We hear a mechanical sigh and suddenly the electricity goes out. We soon learn that the power is out all over town. Never mind the lights, Mama and I still need hair and makeup. In a hotel out by the highway that somehow escaped the blackout, Mama perches on the edge of the bed. She swings her leg and drinks cheap Chablis. I queue up just like starting over by John Lennon while she checks her phone again for messages from well wishers. She skims over a printout of the invited guests and RSVPs, giving final approval on table assignments to Barb, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins from both Mama's and my dad's sides of the family, clusters of Mama and Jim's hometown friends who remember when they were a couple in high school. In the background, Lennon sings his worry of neglected love. It's been so long since we took the time and buoys it with bouncing doo-wop. Lennon is Jim's favorite and any reminder of Jim soothes Mama these days. She's the hostess, but more nervous than usual. She's worried about her parents. My grandpa, a former doctor, has recently started to show his age. He's unable to stand up straight for more than a few minutes because the blood rushes out of his head, making him dizzy, short of breath. Yet he refuses to use a wheelchair, scoffs at a walker. But mama has her girlish heart set on him walking her down the aisle again. My grandparents love Jim, his effusive warmth. Linda needs someone to love, my grandma once told me. I don't think they ever worried about me that way. Jim has promised to look out for Grandpa Pete. He loves him, loves listening to him talk, a serious man with an easy laugh who nicknamed Mama Windy because she talked so much. I could picture Pete as he looked that day, those light blue eyes, wispy hair, dress slacks, and a rich brown leather blazer. I assure Mama that if anyone can convince my grandpa that using a walker is dignified, it's Jim. The teenage stylist flutters over my cheeks and eyelashes, and I ask what mama thinks of my makeup. I'm trying to distract her, but she's already distracted. Her phone rings. It's Jim calling with some bad news. The band claims they can't learn Al Green for the first dance. I tell him not to worry. It's the wrong song anyway. The first dance has to be to Here Comes My Girl from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers 1979 album, Damn the Torpedoes. Mama always insisted that she can't dance, but this beat is easy to find and sway to. It's a talking blues and it's a romance. 
yeah, man, when I got that little girl standing right by my side, you know, I can tell the whole wide world to shove it. For 60 year olds who have worked hard and lost much, it's a love song that rebels against suffering. The chorus swings like a meteor shower. By early evening, the guests start arriving for the ceremony. Through Barb, we hear that the usher we asked to deliver a corsage to my grandmother and seat her at the designated family table has accomplished his task. The problem is he gave it to the wrong grandmother, not mama's mother, my dad's mother. I'm on it, Barb says. Oh my, 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 mama says. I play Sunny by Bobby Hebb, a song that sounds like mama to me. She takes another sip and pulls at the corner of her eyelid. But then she grins, listening. Growing up, Sunny was another of her nicknames for her penny-colored hair and her fizzy disposition. She snaps her fingers and mouths, Sunny, one so true. She loves the way he says it. I'm in the makeup chair, talking with my eyes closed when mama's phone buzzes again. She answers, but I'm trying to get her to recognize how the marimba-like riff of Sunny is ripped straight from the James Bond theme song saying, see, hear that, when she cries out. Back at the barn, Mama's dad, Grandpa Pete, tripped over the threshold, walking in. The foot of the walker stuck to the floor. He fell. The crown of his head gashed open. An aunt is rushing him to the hospital to scan for concussions, for worse. In the mirror, the stylist fingers in my hair, I say, it'll be fine, he'll be fine. But I watch Mama's bright blue eyes obscure in middle distance, her mouth go ragged. In the air around us, Bobby Hebb is still crooning, but Mama bawls, no. Then she stands up and reels out of the room into the hallway. The last song on David number five is Baby Blue by Badfinger. When I was 16, my dad once left Badfinger's greatest hits album on my bedside table. I was angry with him that day as I often was then. His note explained that Badfinger showed more potential songwriting depth than the Beatles. Who knows what they could have become, he said, if Pete Ham hadn't killed himself, if they'd gotten a better break. It was, a ki it was his kind of apology. The only time I vividly remember crying at my dad's services happened just before the doors opened for the wake. A windowless carpeted room dimmed fluorescent lights overhead, my dad's body in a casket against the far wall. Mama bustling through last preparations, grabbing a few translucent handfuls of potato chips. My grandpa Pete sat in the one armchair in the place, his palms steepled. I walked over and sat on the arm beside him, my feet nearly touching the ground. I leaned against his leather jacket, soft chest, and rested my head in the crook between his shoulder and neck, the way I'd done my whole life, sitting together doing crossword puzzles. He held me and said nothing as I sobbed quietly, both of us gazing straight ahead. He was a radiologist, Mama always said, because he had no bedside manner. But that's probably why I went to him, because he didn't console, because he knew our grief was not a problem to be solved. After 15 minutes, Mama still hasn't come back to the room. I shake off the hairstylist and go sprinting down the hotel hallways. I jump down the stairwell, skipping steps. I can hear her somewhere nearby. I can always find her. Her sobs grow louder, resounding in the space. I shear the corner, swinging into the lobby, and see her there in the middle of the room. Mama whimpers. Hotel guests wade around her wreckage. But she is in Jim's arms. At some point, she called. He came. He whispers in her ear. He holds her hair. He'll be there, he says. Better now, he says. Baby. I walk up and press a hand to her back. Her eyes are closed. She clasps my sleeve and two fingers and presses into Jim. I take the elevator back upstairs and put on my dress. There will be other disasters. I forget to eat at the reception and white wine makes my blood rush. The speakers blare too loud and both of my grandmothers hold their ears. My grandpa is all right for now, but misses much of the night. Inexplicably during dessert, the band plays dust in the wind. Mama points it out to me. We grimace at each other and laugh. And then I don't hear it anymore. After the vows and the toast, when it's time for the first dance, the band has not, in fact, learned to play Here Comes My Girl. Before Mama notices, I send them on a smoke break and plug in my iPod. Here is the drumbeat buildup, the chiming piano. Mama and Jim hold each other and dance, moving lightly in the space. The chorus breaks open, a cascading guitar. They keep their eyes on each other. They mouth the words. They grin. And she looks so right. 
she is all I need tonight. They stroll around the floor, their fingers touching. And even though it isn't my job anymore, I keep watching from among the amps and wires. I laugh and then I laugh harder and then I stop. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. That was amazing. I really, yeah, I really love it. That was really great. Um, all right, we're gonna do it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Everyone who's still, uh, still, still going. So uh, everyone can uh, mute, put your questions in the chat. Um, so uh, we have a question from uh, John and John asks, are you a musician? You no, play? I'm not a musician. I played the flute badly for some years and I uh, was in school choir, but no, I'm just a, I'm just a really hard um, and admiring listener. All right. Uh, so with that, so all of so your love for music came from your family and from your father. Was there music going on all the time in your house? Yeah, very often. It was really sort of our central, it was part of our like family culture. It was part of the household. It was, I was sort of steeped in the icons of my parents, you know, generation of music and and sort of the people that they held up on high. Um, the way that I imagine other kids are steeped in other cultural figures or religion or something like that. Um, that was sort of our religion and philosophy and, and worldview. Um, but my dad was also just a huge music fan who really kept up to date. So it wasn't just about, um, you know, the music that they came up with, but it, he was also very plugged into what was going on. Um, in popular and underground music just all along the way. So that was a real resource for me. I thought I was pretty cool. Now, your decision to have this as an audio book um, and not in print, yeah. um, what did the audio book do that a print book couldn't do? And also, are you planning to release this in print? And I might know the answer because I want to I want to know how you scored Pine Grove's, uh, <laughs> so I'm a big fan of theirs. Yeah, so um, so yeah, so this was released, um, published by Audible. Um, so I sold the audio rights to Audible um, first, so it would come out as this as this memoir, literary memoir, but in audio form first. And that was a real. That was not what I expected when I was just sort of in the thick of writing the book. I always pictured it as being a more traditional print book, you know, that you could hold in your hand, but as it came time working with my agent to send to editors, she had worked with Audible before on a music-based memoir and thought it might be an exciting option. And then once they wanted to, to buy the manuscript talking about the different possibilities, it just seemed like a really wonderful fit for a music-obsessed memoir and, and for a story that for me is so intimate um, to have that other layer of intimacy where it's me narrating my own story sort of directly into your earbuds. Um, mm -hmm. it was it was fun to to think about how expansive that form could be because it's not it's not a podcast. It's not just a narrated text. It's not a radio drama. It sort of gets to be its own thing. And so, as you mentioned, it gets to have an original score. Um, so there's there's original music scored under my narration for the entire project, which runs about four hours. Um, and my friend, Evan Stevens Hall, who is the, the lead, um, the central musician in a band called Pine Grove, um, luckily I was able to we've been looking for a way to collaborate over the years and um and he was up for this this challenge and so i was able to bring him on to to that's, do that score that's incredible because usually if you've got to bring someone on that's not a friend of yours the rights to use the music are outrageous yeah it was really amazing so we've known each other for some years and um i've written you know some album bios for their when their different releases come out but we had been talking for years about different projects that we could do and so um he had never he was really he's a really literary guy and he was really excited by the idea like this project of doing something totally different and i think that we just trusted each other um 
that I felt like he feels like I understand what he's trying to do. He understands what I'm trying to do. And that was really exciting because I've, for so long, I've been on sort of the other side of writing about music, writing about musicians. And finally, I got to actually collaborate with a musician. And so um, highly recommend that to, to anyone. <laughs> And it was it was really cool and um, something that I never thought that, you know, working in the space of just writing would would bring me. That's great. So before I go to the questions on the board, I want to ask you, you started writing this book before Tom Petty died. And yeah. when Tom Petty died, while you were you done with the book or were you in the middle of it? And how did that affect you? Yeah. So I started writing this book in 2015. That was sort of the first time that it occurred to me that, cause I was writing music criticism, I was writing personal narrative, I was writing a lot of fiction, um, but it was the first time that it occurred to me to sort of bring my natural modes of, instead of keeping them separate, that the way that I could tell this very personal story had to be combined with the way that I experienced the world, which is through the music that I love. And that, you know, it's sort of inextricable for me. And so that was 2015 and then, he died in 2017 and I was absolutely devastated. I mean, absolutely just, it was, it was interesting because I was writing about sort of how our primary losses repeat and replay throughout our lives in different situations and, and these different patterns that we have. And then to have the musical figure who's my most important musician die during that process, it opened it up again, you know, it was like replaying again. So it was, um, yeah, it was an opportunity I to, to dig into that. But it was really, I had a hard time writing about um, that loss in the moment, because I was freelance writing and writing for, for music. So there was like pressure to when any, anything like this happens, I mean, Sinead O'Connor just died, right? And you have yeah. all of this, all of these remembrances coming out, and there's pressure to to publish your reaction to it and your obituary, your, you know, hot take even um, in the moment and sort of join that stream. And I really had to step back and say, no, I have to actually just grieve this as I would grieve any, any major loss. Um, and, and the right, the, the words about it will come later. You talked about just now about breaking patterns and breaking pa patterns of family and maybe some family dynamics and stuff. And after your father moved, you moved to the town that your parents met and you worked there and you worked in the music field. Um, did you were you fearful that you might repeat some of your father's mistakes or did was there a was there a because it sounds like you intentionally tried to repeat that pattern? Did you have like a a moment that you just said, "Hey, wait a minute." Yeah, so the the present action of the book, it you know, it moves back and forth in time. It you get a lot of um, my family life, um, but it, the the present action is when I moved back to I moved to Bloomington, Indiana, where I had never lived, um, but I was in my mid twenties. I moved there for graduate school, but that is the town where my parents um, got together and got married as twenty year olds in the seventies, and so. I moved there because it was this opportunity. It was rich in family history, and I had the opportunity to to have some years to write. Um, and it turned out to be this very trippy experience because the town isn't that different than it was in the '70s. And so I was sort of trying to create a new life on top of my parents' family history in a way that I never knew them. So I, I remember I met someone. I was talking to someone during that time period. And they said, oh, it's like you're haunting them. Like I was the ghost, <laughs> like haunting the past somehow. Um, and it turned out to be a really rich space, like physical space for me to be in, um, even though I wasn't at that point writing this project, but it informed then what I was writing about. And and yeah, I mean, I don't know if I mentioned this, but my my dad died of alcoholism and addiction when I was a teenager. And so that sort of is something that I always have to contend with in my life and is part of um, it, like because I identify so strongly with who he was. I mean, I'm basically I'm very similar to him, like contending with 
an understanding of, of deep darkness and depression and, and the ways that that manifests itself. Um, that's always going to be sort of part of the story of grief as well. Yeah. Let's move to some questions here. Robert asked, I'm going to say, can fiction include music and lyrics to move the story forward? And if so, what would it add? Oh, okay. So can fiction use it? So, oh, fiction. Okay. Um, so you have to be tricky. This is a very technical answer to this, but you have to be careful in using lyrics because it gets really litigious. It can, it can. So like down the line and publishing books and everything, um, you mostly have, like if it's, if you're quoting a lot, you have to get that approved and um, that can be very difficult. So I recommend that it never, the like quoting of other people's art is never the hinge, right, of the meaningful action, that it is, it is more about texture and reflection than being something that you can't remove if you need to, right? Um, that the, the real ideas of your work are coming, are arising from what you've created, um, as opposed to leaning too heavily on the work of others, which I like, as a music obsessed person, when I'm writing fiction into like, it does sneak in there. And then I got to take it out usually, especially in writing fiction. Um, and just make sure I'm not using it as scaffolding or a crutch. But yeah, I, I am all for sort of more writing about music. I feel like writing about music can feel really intimidating for people and also pointless. It's hard right? to yeah, they say like, what's the point of it? It's dancing about architecture, right? Like you're gilding the lily. Music is music. Music is immediate. Um, but I'm always interested in in the ways that we can add different texture and other arts into, like, how can we evoke it in language? So, all for are you, Brian says, are you familiar with the Tom Petty bio by Warren Zanes? Yes, yes, I am. I've read it. Okay. Um, RJ says, writing a memoir must fill the author with a flood of emotions about many memories we lived. Is there a certain remembrance in your book that you found nearly overwhelming to commit to the page? Oh, that's such a good question. It's such a good question. And I'm having a hard time thinking of, a, of one example now, but I know that in trying to figure out what to narrativize and what to create scenes for, right? Because you have to choose, right? This is this is a curated um, depiction of our like vast experiences. So I had to choose scenes and memories that would evoke the larger story that I'm telling and that also had that emotional heat to it right? It had to feel urgent and it had to feel risky. It had to feel kind of hard to write. Um, and that's why I think writing memoir can take so long, right? Because some things you're just not ready to re-enter or you don't, you're, you know, maybe you're writing to figure out what they mean, but you're not even ready to do that yet. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's always a balance of um, trying to make the art while living at the same time. <laughs> These things are happening and informing each other. So um, yeah, it's that balance of, of writing the things that are, are emotionally risky for you um, while listening to yourself and being, you know, figuring out like, okay, I'm going to put that aside for now. I'm not ready to go there yet, um, but someday I will. Great answer. Uh, from Karen, was there any tension for you at your mother's wedding to Jim and was your dad's shadow around? Oh, um, um branching into all kinds of metaphysical stuff here. I love it. Yeah. Um, did you say was my dad's shadow around? Is yeah. That... Oh, I yeah. I miss you in that description of your mother's wedding. You yeah. seem wonderfully supportive, extraordinarily loving. Your mother has moved on and you're documenting that but i don't hear you there yeah i hear you seeing that but i don't know where katie is where where are you yeah yeah i mean there's 
that was there's a lot of tension in that motion right because so a lot of the book is i'm i'm back in my parents past um trying to figure out my like life as a young person right. um and at the same time my mom is also moving forward in a different way while reconnecting to her past so jim was actually her high school boyfriend before she got together with my dad so it was it's this sort of time is mixing and collapsing so um yeah it was it's a, it's a real trip um <laughs> and so of course there's tension um and i hope that there are so many ways to write a single experience and i think for this particular piece i wanted to dig into the sort of misguided ways that I tried to prevent my mother from feeling any more pain right through these through music like through 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 a, the correct soundtracking right and all of these other machinations to to just try to be a barrier um to like sort of protect her and realizing that I can't it's misguided and also at the end it's not my job anymore and maybe it never was right and so um there's not a lot of room in this in that in those scenes for me as you're saying to break down to lose it to to like really you know submerge in my own feelings or whatever because i'm so concerned with um sort of holding it together which i think is um you know something that we see a lot in in these sort of relationships so it is it's sort of about that and i i think that the absence of of me is also part of the story there all right we got a question for paul from paul which looks like a part technical and part um how things work did you create the whole package with the music and present it to audible or did you first send the book as a proposal how does that work yeah, so no, I um I just my agent just sent an editor my text manuscript um without an idea of what form it would really take. And then um when they made an offer to buy it, they said, Well, we can do any number of things. What do you want to do? And so then there was I had a lot of creative freedom there to figure out what are the possibilities, um, what are my hopes for this this work and so the <laughs> understanding audible's budget and um and and the the technical possibilities of what they could do came after um came after that so it was all in conjunction with them because they have whole teams of engineers and producers and um yeah all of that so it was cool and one i mean this is a little this is technical but this is a technical question um they're they have different audible is audible is owned by amazon and auto and that it was complicated for me um but because they're owned by amazon they do have a lot of money and that allows me to do certain things and to pay my friend my very talented friend and um and i wanted to figure out a way that i could then limit the amount other people had to pay for it so I could have done my my original manuscript was was larger than this. And they were like, for that amount of size, then it would be this kind of offering. And people would pay this much to listen to your book, to buy your book. But if you shorten it, it can become an audible original. And that then is free to any subscriber. And so I thought, I want to make this as accessible as possible. I'm a debut. Um, and I, I, you know, want people to just like have a free trial and be able to listen to my book for free if that's what they want to do, you know, right. If that, so it, like whatever barriers I could remove, that was also part of it for me. So I shortened it to, it's only 40,000 words, um, instead of, you know, the longer book size and I decided to release it as audible, audible original. Um, so all of that was sort of part of this technical process of figuring out how this story would be told in audio form first. All right, last question. 
because we've got a ton of we had a ton of questions. People are really, really interested in the, you and your book and what you have to say. Last question. When writing your memoir, were there other memoirs or books you read or researched which helped or added inspiration to yours? Oh, that's such a good question. And now, you know, this is like one of those things like when someone's like, what's your like, what are you listening to? And your mind goes blank. What's the best book you read this year? Um, let's see. When writing your memoir, were there any other memoirs or books? Okay, I read or researched, which helped. Okay, so one thing is I did I did a lot of research in Tom Petty. Into Tom Petty. I mean, I like was a huge fan and I'd seen the Heartbreakers like 20 something times in concert. And um I was well versed, but I did research um and I read the bio like the Zane's bio. Um, but I really tried to stay away from other writing and criticism um, about Petty and the Heartbreakers in particular, because I didn't, I wanted to form, I just wanted to have my own critical reaction to things and, and have it really steeped in my personal and emotional experience first, right? It's, it's, that's where it's seated. It's super subjective. Um, but then later, then I've like let myself read some Tom Petty books and they're really great. Um, there's this 33 and a third. Um, do you know that series, 33 and a third? Oh, yeah. Series? Yeah, where each one focuses on a particular album. And there is a recent title by Michael Washburn that focuses on the Heartbreakers album, uh, Southern Accent. And it's really good. And I really recommend it. And I'm really glad that I didn't read it before I wrote my book or finished my book because... <laughs> I feel like his voice would have gotten in my head around certain things, especially in thinking about, um, you know, a complicated Southern identity. And uh, yeah, so highly recommend the 33 and a third on Southern accents. Um, and I'm trying to say, oh, um, you know, I'll shout out Hanif Abdurraqib, who's a poet and a music critic and um, writer of creative nonfiction. Um, because he often blends personal essay and writing about pop music. And his mind is sort of more seated in personal narrative. His is more music criticism first with like dashes of personal, of memoir. Um, and my, But I think that his book, A Little Devil in America, is really worth checking out. It's notes on um, Black performance and I think that's his best work and um, so far. And it's, um, yeah, recommended. Well, Katie, thank you so much. You are delightful. Um, here, is the, here is the book uh, for folks. And uh, give it a listen. It's uh, free with the Audible trial. Listen, there it is right for you, just as we <laughs> talked about. And it's 1147, cheaper than a compact disc. So uh, <laughs> everyone check that out. And, you know, Authors do appearances, not because they, they want to sell their shit, just saying. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. And thank you for, yeah. thank you for, for the questions. If you're streaming this on uh, and watching it on the Facebook group, um, use the link if you want to be part of the open mic. If you ask questions within the Facebook group, I am so sorry. I don't see those. But uh, thank you for watching and come back in two weeks. Thank you so much. Timothy and everyone, wonderful questions. Thank you. Can't thank you enough.